Good morning, or good afternoon, or even good evening, everyone. It's Alan Schimmel of DevOps.com, and we're here for another great go to uh, webinar, a webinar on, uh, from our DevOps.com series. Today's webinar is sponsored by our friends at Jump Cloud. Actually, we have a great webinar lined up for today. It's Identity Management the DevOps Way How to Automate Your Identity Management, User Onboarding, and you know, Automation being one of the key key pieces of the DevOps puzzle. Before we dive in here and I introduce our presenters, let me just quickly go over our GoToWebinar control panel with you. We have set aside time for questions and, and really questions make the webinar. So if you look at your GoToWebinar control panel, which is in the upper right hand corner for most of you, you'll see a section marked questions. If you hit the little carrot or arrow so it's pointing downward, the question section will expand and you can see you could type your questions in there in real time. If you're anything like me, I encourage you to type your questions in in real time. Don't wait to type them in at the end when we might be asking for questions because you may have multiple questions that pop into your brain and, and you'll forget one. I know I always do. So please put your question in in real time as it kind of pops into your head. And this way it's queued. We have it in there and we'll be sure or do our best to get to it. As is often the case, we may get more questions than we have time for. But by putting your question into the question section, we do have a record of it. And uh, even after the fact, if we can't get to it live today, we can ask our esteemed presenters to answer your question in writing. And we can include that or get that out to you. So please ask questions, ask as many as you'd like. We'll do our best to get to them all, put them in there. However, questions are not for technical issues. If you're having a technical issue, the slides are not advancing, audio's not working, everything, something's not working, but you can still hit the chat section, which is, should be the last section in your GoToWebinar panel. Please, just uh, if you can type into there, we do have engineers standing by who will try to help with your technical issues so that you can enjoy the webinar. Finally, let me answer the first question that we always get with these webinars. Is this being recorded and will the slides be available? Yes and yes, we are recording. Uh, the webinar will be available on the DevOps uh, TV YouTube channel from DevOps.com as well as on our website. Slides will be there as well. So with, with that out of the way, let us now turn to our webinar today, which as I mentioned before, is Identity Management the DevOps Way, Automating Identity Management and User Onboarding. Our panel today, we've got two great folks on our panel. First, let me introduce you to a friend of mine who I've had the pleasure of knowing now for probably four years or so, um, Greg Keller, Chief Product Officer at Jump Cloud. Greg, welcome to today's webinar. Mr. Schimmel, thank you so much and indeed great to hear your voice again. Okay, and um, and then our special guest star today, and I'm hopefully not going to mess up his name too bad, but it's Nick La Lafiere, Nick, not too bad, uh, DevOps engineer at Tamer. Nick, welcome. Hey, glad to be here. Great, that was our sound check. You sound great, Nick. Okay, with this being said, Greg, you're the expert. I'm going to turn it over to you, and let's find out how we do identity management the DevOps way. Great. Uh, and again, Alan, and for the whole DevOps crew, we appreciate this time and sort of the, the audience that you've been able to assemble uh, via your platform. We appreciate it. Mr. Leferrier, it is an honor to be speaking with you. Thank you again for your business and your counsel um, and frankly enabling us to witness how a company at the scale of Tamer uh, is effectively a, a luminary example of modern IT. Uh, so with all of that said, um, you're going to find today, folks, that this is uh, a conversation. I'm going to begin with a few slides, uh, basically just exposing what Jump Cloud's kind of observation is in the world of IT because this is frankly where we play with our product. But we'll quickly transition into a dialogue with Nick because he is the operator that I want you to listen to today. So without further ado, let's jump in. Uh, the agenda is very crisp. Uh, we want to really talk about the new dawn of IT and what DevOps is doing uh, in terms of a progressive nature 
moving things forward fast uh, in enterprise. We'll then dip into identity challenges within the DevOps community, and I think many of you will appreciate them. And then finally, moving into Tamer's uh, expose on DevOps, how they do it, and what identity means to them. The remaining items will be uh, an overview of GemCloud and a demonstration of the platform. And finally, and probably most importantly, a Q&A with you, our audience. So let's move into this. So a new era for IT, which is DevOps. Um, GemCloud is very, very, um, it's a, we're in an interesting intersection. Um, there's, there's this confluence of, of things that we sit in the middle of. Uh, GemCloud is, a identity management and access solution, something we refer to as a directory as a service. So when you really think about that and you think about an IT architecture, our product sits at the epicenter of the ability of your network to be able to respond to providing access to resources your, your employees needs, whether they're, they're systems, network storage, or applications. But interestingly, the um, Jump Cloud itself, we are a DevOps culture. So let's talk about what I mean by that. Um, Jump Cloud, like many modern companies, uh, we are roughly four years old. Uh, we were born in the cloud. Um, the operators, you know, all of us that you know, sort of formed this company and we were operating the company, um, there wasn't a lot of like legacy baggage that we had to to worry about. Uh, we are Amazon customers. We, you know, leverage most everything in the cloud. When and if you were ever to walk in our office, what would you see here? Well, you'd see a vast modern open space floor uh, with lots of stand-up desks, lots of Lenovo's running, you know, Linux, um, lots of MacBooks, and Cisco Meraki wireless access points. It, that's it. There's nothing here on-prem. With, uh, actually, let me be clear. Maybe with the with the exception of a Synology NAS that we, we utilize for, for testing, frankly. Everything else is up in the cloud, most ex importantly, our platform. So the culture of our engineering is a DevOps-focused culture. Those who code actually appreciate CI, CD. They understand the mechanisms to get uh, software moving through a system fast out to our customers. The other way of looking at this in our culture here at GemCloud is there's not a, like a lot of traditional IT. Like we, for example, help desk support. What, what is that really like? Like getting a, a laptop set up, you know, for an employee? Well, we just DEP that through Apple, right? The engineers, we ensure that they are setting up their own machines. So we buy them a raw Lenovo and we hand them the, you know, the, the book and they install CentOS or Ubuntu on it and that's their job. You know, that's what they want to do. But everything else, there's no on-prem, you know, sort of human resource that's shuttling around doing, you know, sort of traditional IT tasks. That's, we've moved all of those things to the cloud through services uh, or in the case of, you know, device enrollment through Mac, you know, and they just drop ship machines to our spec right to us. So again, all of us in IT here are, are a progressive, fast-moving, DevOps-focused culture. But we're here today to talk about kind of a sub-segment of, of DevOps, uh, and it's related to the identity management challenges and, frankly, the security that encompasses all of this. And we're going to talk to Nick here in a second on that. But let me, again, in the spirit of laying down a backdrop, let's talk through a few of these things uh, and then we'll get into some good dialogue with Nick. First and foremost, you know, the sort of management of hybrid environments. Uh, many of you on this call um, may not have such a quote unquote pristine environment as Jump Cloud, where we were, you know, quote, blessed to build everything up in Amazon and Google Cloud, and, you know, there's nothing on premise, and, um, you know, life is sort of ephemeral in that way. We can just spin up servers. Um, you know, integrate, use our CI CD tooling through salt and, you know, we're just cranking. But many of you actually don't have that luxury. You're managing perhaps colos, perhaps actual physical infrastructure that you must have hands on, but you are attempting 
to get parts of your infrastructure up to the cloud so you have one foot in the physical real world probably at your office location and you have one quote virtualized foot up in the cloud uh, and you're spanning your IT you know bandwidth uh, and your capabilities uh, in, in order to manage that onslaught so as an example many traditional IT folks that we speak to um, you know many who have built elaborate and beautiful Microsoft centric on-premise networks revolving around Active Directory and connected to Microsoft endpoints uh, that, that's an amazing thing to do but when and if your company has objectives to move elements of this to the cloud a what are those things B me as an IT professional do I have the skill sets to do that I've never even logged into an Amazon dashboard before what does that mean so again there's this there's the the schooling part of it and then there's the efficiency part of it once you really know what you're doing to frankly manage infrastructure spanning the real world and the virtualized world moving in um, is this concept that many of you and I'm watching you even though you can't see me rolling your eyes with the concept of shadow IT um, effort you know let me basically posture a bit here jump cloud um, yes we are a DevOps culture all that stuff but we are first and foremost a security company that that's what we do and we provide services that we give to you to better secure your company but we have to do it right first so the one of the things that we self audit for are instances of things and those things could be you know um, applications that have their own identity and access like their own user accounts on them or rogue LDAP servers etc we're going to talk about that in a second but things that aren't necessarily governed that do need to provide operational efficiencies for frankly the IT team but they're not governed globally by some architecture a security architecture or strategy ie through maybe a uh, institutional or governing directory right so as we're we're sort of seeing the world of DevOps expand um, we're, we are also seeing the propagation of some bad practices happen it's gotten so easy to build virtualized infrastructure and it's gotten so easy to find recipes and cookbooks and other things to spin up you know again an LDAP server even though you're managing it it's becoming um, kind of commonplace, but it puts you in that IT and DevOps organization in kind of a hairy position as it relates to security. So it, it's an impulse to easily solve your own IT problem because you don't want to be governed, but please understand it's going to potentially put your organization at risk um, having these rogue siloed instances of authentication. This, uh, moving into the next slide, this is just an instantiation of that concept. Um, you know, while there are recipes and you can download open LDAP um, and in order to sort of authenticate and use SSH for, you know, your Linux infrastructure, which is typically the primary shadow use case, IT use case for LDAP servers, um, it doesn't mean A, it's secure, we've already talked about that, but B, um, I still, you know, you know, have trouble even envisioning why people have to do this. I know there's a control variable here. Seasoned engineers want to build and own and frankly virtually hug their own LDAP servers, but it's on you to build it, configure it, make it redundant. Don't even look at it because it could fall over. Um, as you'll see when we move into the jump cloud part of this presentation you should be putting that onus both the security and the resilience and uptime on us and let you start to focus on other bigger priorities like making your CICD process more efficient uh, going to conferences that will it teach you uh, you know saltification of your infrastructure if that's your you know chosen mechanism or chef or puppet whatever it is not building a 30 year old protocol on an LDAP server um, you should again trust us with that this leads us into the next part just the time sinks it dovetails into exactly what I'm saying when when you look at you know the as is state of your IT and that includes like where you're at from a maturity scale in building a DevOps culture um, 
Everything that you're doing to manage and drag yourself down an on-premise infrastructure, shadow IT nonsense, you know, traditional IT help desk stuff that you are getting sucked into even though you desire to be in your 2B state, which is a continuous scaling, fast moving DevOps culture, um, you need to start to partition what's the stuff that doesn't need to be on my plate? What can we you know, trust as a service to provide us the infrastructure for? And where can we you know, turn our attention to more progressive needs that our leadership at co your companies need us to be, right? It could be better security infrastructure. It could be faster scaling. It could be better redundancy. I'm just, I'm speaking your language. I know you understand this, but you have to get out of the cycle of getting pulled into uh, you know, traditional time sucks. And again, this, this finally, I'm sort of preceding myself here. Um, this is all a function of getting you out of the old and into the new, the time you actually need to service your company by becoming a DevOps culture, just like we are. And we are, you know, we're learning every day, every day about new advantageous ways to take advantage of infrastructure that is typically virtualized at scale that doesn't require a lot of human babysitting. Like those are our benchmarks, that and of course security. So now with that as a backdrop, we want to turn our attention over to our good friend, Mr. Nick LaFerrier, um, and we want to learn how his company, Tamer, automates DevOps and specifically identity and access management. Um, so without further ado, I would like to turn this over to, um, to Nick. What, and Nick, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, just as a recap, um, what I want to do here is do, a, frankly, kind of a Q&A with you. And I'm going to walk through a series of slides that are simply going to prompt us. It, it'll, it'll begin a dialogue. Um, just to understand a little bit about, about your infrastructure. Uh, but before we begin, can you just say hello and tell us about yourself and give us a quick background on Tamer and what your area of responsibility is? Yeah, so right now I'm the lead DevOps engineer at Tamer. Um, we are basically a self-service uh, data unification platform. Uh, we have a ton of developers, the organization's probably around 100 people right now. We are very similar to kind of Jump Cloud in the fact that we're still kind of a relatively young company. We're about five years old. Everything was built from the ground up in AWS and GCP. Uh, basically, the only thing we have in our office is networking gear. It happens to be Meraki, uh, just like yep. Jump Cloud. Exactly. Um, and, like, we have a wide range of engineers using Linux laptops, Macs, to all of our Linux servers in the cloud. Got it, got it. That's actually gonna, a good segue into sort of beginning our kind of inquisition. Tell us a little bit about your DevOps environment, everything from, you know, to the extent that you can talk to us, we wanna appreciate your security, but just generally speaking, um, your CICD process and or, you know, your methods of choice, um, y y your infrastructure, give us like a little bit of a blueprint. Yeah, so from kind of the raw infrastructure level, we'll start there and work our way up. So we are mainly GCP now. We started off in Amazon. Uh, we've been slowly kind of shifting things over. One of the kind of nice things from our perspective was the fact that because all of our actual logins to servers are managed with Jump Cloud, really didn't have to do a ton of work to worry about like switching users over to GCP, uh, which was nice. Uh, we use Terraform to kind of manage all of our infrastructure to interact with all the APIs to give yep. us the ability to spin clusters up and down. Uh, from the configuration management layer, Ansible is our tool of choice. Uh, previously I've used Puppet, but for what we're doing, what we need, Ansible is just a better fit. Um, and then on top of that, uh, our actual stack is built on top of Mesos and Marathon. Uh, we have our own package manager that we use on top of it. Um, and that kind of is 
we run a series of Mesos clusters to represent like different customer scenarios versus um, because we have like a cluster that's all Ubuntu machines, we have a cluster that's all Red Hat 7 machines, we have a CentOS cluster. Uh, so we're kind of all over the place inside of Linux, yep. uh, too, which makes having kind of this unified user platform great for us. Um, yeah, and then in the office, as I mentioned before, we're mainly Mac and Linux. I think we have one or two Windows people uh, that somewhere, I think, in sales, so, somewhere that... <laughs> There's always yeah. the finance uh, guy with the Windows machine. <laughs> yeah, that's like the Windows version of Excel is what they want to use for whatever reason, yep. even though I think everyone uses Google Docs. Um, so, yeah, that's a, also a big, uh, big part of us is we're Google Apps. Uh, so having kind of the integration with Jump Cloud to be able to manage that is huge for us. Uh, that's... Yeah, is there anything else that's kind of missing from... No, you nailed it. And we're going to get into some other kind of, um, you know, questions about your past, about the, you know, about where you're looking forward. But yeah, you you just defined a lot of like Jump Cloud's infrastructure. We 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 ended up over the past, you know, the in the early years we had a disparity of the different um, distros we were using uh, from a Linux kind of standpoint. We ended up, uh, you know, for obvious reasons, consolidating, moving forward, and just so we have a, a, a an actual fingerprint of what our, you know, chosen long-term service, you know, instances will be. And so we get a Terraform we're through and through with. Um, so it's identical. It's really cool to hear. Let's move into the, a little bit of the past, Nick. Um, when we talk about identity management, you kind of just t slightly touched upon this vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, authentication to your Linux servers. What was time like before Jump Cloud? So what was the auth and identity process like? Yeah, so way back when, before we had kind of any centralized place for it, the only, uh, we had set up at least internally uh, an LDAP server, but had all kind of the nightmare scenarios you could ever list about actually running a server and treating it kind of like a pet. Like, this fills up, then for whatever reason, because the disk was filled up, the LDAP server wouldn't off users because it couldn't write to its log. And it thought that the primary thing that it was responsible for was an audit process. Yep. So we had painful things like that. Um, and then some users just refused to use the LDAP server. So what they ended up doing was they would create their own key in Amazon. And Amazon's APIs are really easy to do that. And every time you launch a machine, we'll just say, hey, create a new key for you automatically. Uh, at one point, we literally had about 200 keys in Amazon. So from an admin perspective, it was basically impossible to actually admin into machines to help people out to debug issues, to kind of build clusters. Yeah. It was complete chaos. Uh, we were kind of all over the spectrum. It just wasn't a pleasant experience. You onboard someone and it'd be like, this team uses, like each team would basically use their own set of standards for how they would manage their sets of servers. So if you were onboarding someone, it'd basically be, Wild Wild West, you could give them some pointers to like, maybe this wiki page is up to date, really talk to your team lead, and then if you have to interact with another team, that's a completely different story, and it was basically impossible to manage. Um, and it, it's just complete chaos, uh, yeah, in terms of historically. We have absolutely seen that, and I, I've lived that, I, I, and I can viscerally appreciate it. Let me, uh, so you're sort of talking about, um, you know, the, the me part of the infrastructure identity management, who was or was like employee facing identity even talked about back then? Like, for example, like someone gets a MacBook, hey, welcome to Tamer. Um, here's your MacBook, <laughs> you know, was that thing even governed? No, we actually still don't kind of govern our laptops right now. So right now we're bringing your own device, uh, for like yep. interns and some executives, we do manage the laptop for them. And we do that through Jump Cloud. For the most part, it's bring your own device, and then if you want to access any internal services, you're going to have to opt through Jump Cloud. So basically, right. the office is kind of like a really nice Starbucks. Uh, <laughs> we, we think we have more options in terms of coffee with like cold brew kegs and um, <laughs> snacks, but. Uh, 
to off onto the Wi-Fi, you need to go through Jump Cloud and then to connect to anything in the cloud, you have to go log into the VPN, which is tied to Jump Cloud, you get into the server, the SSH keys are managed by Jump Cloud, and then all of our services online are either tied into Google Apps, which Jump Cloud itself manages the Google Apps, or we do through SAML through Jump Club. Uh, so basically, it's we it's entirely bring your own device. Any type of authentication uh, is tied through Jump Cloud. So it makes basically someone day one we say here's how you access Jump Cloud. Here's how you get into Google Apps, and basically go from there. That's perfect. In fact. You just answered the next question, which which it basically is, how are you using Junk Cloud now? And you just gave a, a fairly elegant um, fingerprint of what that feels like. So it's cool to hear. I, I'm, I'm going to rip off your analogy of like our office is like a glorified Starbucks. So you, you've been warned. You're, you're not allowed to trademark that. <laughs> so now you mentioned... In, in the past, um, you know, you began life on an Amazon backbone, so to speak. You moved to GCP. Um, it, you know, to be quite honest and transparent, uh, Gem Cloud does utilize both of those cloud services as well, our infrastructure as a service platforms. Um, tell us a little bit about your switch uh, from Amazon to GCP, what the main driver was, um, and Gem Cloud's role in that. Yeah, so our main driver was um, some cost stuff. We're a GV company, so there were some incentives there, too, that they were um, very happy to have us switch over. Uh, and it just came down to we found that the infrastructure was better, the running machines were more stable, CPU, what actual CPU meant was kind of more predictable, um, the ability to have kind of the flexible instance types where we can just say, here's how many CPUs and how much RAM we want, and then just the I.O. performance of the disks were much better. Mm -hmm. So those were kind of the two primary things. One of kind of the tangential things was the fact that we've been running a basically an Amazon account that was created since the beginning of the company. So there was just a lot of legacy stuff there, and we were looking to kind of do whether even if we were to stay with Amazon, uh, basically a clean, fresh environment uh, that we kind of had where we knew all of our DevOps team had admin access to everything. Everything was done to what is the best practices of right now, um, which like we were going to kind of refactor all of our SAML roles in Jump Cloud anyway, instead of just we only had kind of like a read only admin for EC2 and then super user. Um, we we're gonna refactor all of that. And one of the nice things about Google Cloud was this, their tie-in with Google Apps is actually, your Google Apps company is really nice in terms of just being able to say, hey, you're awesome with Google Apps. That's your SSO, you can just go from there. That's um, right. Yeah, we, we witnessed them uh, over the last year kind of decouple um, sort of, the, the, well, let me take a step back. Google had a, a unified identity, um, commonly known as the Google Apps or G Suite identity, meaning you'd build a user account and the user account would get all these services you had to pay for, like, G, you know, for example, Gmail or Drive or whatever. Um, I think they uh, woke up and, you know, frankly, the Microsoft Azure Active Directory and Office 365 model um, was really the appropriate model. That was you build an identity and then you stack on the services that the identity needs. Um, in your case, um, you know, we own um, the identity or, you know, frankly, the password behind a G Suite account or now a Google Cloud identity account. That means Jump Cloud is owning it, but you're utilizing it for, that employs everything that's related to Google, anything that's OAuth, including their IAM access on Google Cloud. Yeah. Cool. So from a results standpoint, um, you know, we, you know, Jump Cloud, as you know, and you've witnessed, doesn't really care what platform you're on. We're not dedicated to Amazon or GCP. Um, we own, you know, basically the connection to the Linux distro through the agent. But what was some of your results that you saw on the transition? How long did it take? Um, are you completely there? 
Yeah, so uh, basically it's like uh, where I think we have something like 90% of our services over the jump cloud. There's always that one person in market, or at least a company our size, that one person in marketing that has a corporate credit card that signs up for some service that they're testing to send out emails or something that we don't have tied in, and that kind of plays at that shadow IT organization. Um, it's kind of hard to tell, but for the most part, anything that matters that like we have sensitive data is on, like our servers or cloud, we have tied into Jump Cloud. Um, and we do use the agent heavily. That's how we kind of manage all the users on our servers. Uh, I know like the rollout itself, I think it was about two weeks to do a rollout in terms of tying in like the SAML stuff, tying in our Meraki endpoints, uh, and actually pushing it to all of our servers. Um, it was very kind of easy to, we ended up writing our own Ansible role to install the agent. Um, and that was relatively straightforward to do. It was like an afternoon's project. Uh, it's also kind of like a great project to give to junior engineer type of thing because it's pretty clean cut and simple to do. Yep. Or if you're just switching over to kind of whatever configuration management software you're using, it's pretty good first project. Uh, the longest part of the actual rollout for us was uh, simply like we had to bake at AMIs for a lot of our kind of automation infrastructure. Like we use Team City and use the Team City cloud agents to spin up machines. It was more time to roll those machines and kind of get the new AMIs out there and set up correctly for that than anything else. But we were able to basically do uh, full switch over in a two week sprint with exactly. just one full time engineer working on it. That's pretty amazing to hear. Uh, and for my education, this is uh, you know an actual question. Are you hitting our REST API services during any part of your sort of, you know, let's say an AMI is spun up or a new image on GCP is spun up. Are there any, you know, boot up scripts that's, that are banging against our API like many of our other sort of customers do? Yeah, we have some scripts that we actually got work to get through your uh, customer success team that handles kind of bootstrapping the agent, uh, kind of taking the machine, registering within Jump Cloud, applying your guys' right tags, which are anything now you guys are switching over to groups yep. to the machine to get the right set of users into it. That's right. Yeah, I, yeah. I had a, I mean, you guys are pretty core DevOps. Like that's sort of, it's money for many of our really progressive uh, IT folks, again, DevOps folks like you to hit our rest. They, it, it's doing exactly what you're describing. You know, it's it's basically a boot up sequence. It grabs the appropriate POSIX groups and members and, you know, dumps them on the Linux distro or, you know, on the spinning up distro. Um, so it's cool to hear that you're taking advantage of that as well. Now, from um, a standpoint of just, you know, why Gem Cloud? Um, give us a little bit of an idea of like why you guys move forward with us. Uh, it was you guys basically had all the integration points we wanted and kind of thought about the cloud the same way we do in terms of, you know, like similar just when talking to you in your sales, like first of all, when you start doing, we knew we weren't going to buy a Windows server to host AD. When you start talking about doing user management, we were at the size of a company where we needed to do that. Having the one guy that onboards people or like the head engineering, three people's accounts, doesn't scale beyond your first, I don't know, 20 people. Uh, so we were at a scale where we needed some type of directory service. I've managed AD before in the past, but all of our stack and all of our toolings around Linux really didn't want to add an AD server to it. Uh, especially didn't want to have to host anything ourselves like in our office. So when we started kind of doing this look for identity services, there is like the Zor like 365 Active Directory. Amazon has something equivalent to that. But then the question becomes, how do we then manage Google Apps? And Jump Cloud was kind of the one-stop shopping for kind of all our needs, like Google Apps, identity management, we were able, uh, the agents kind of just even bonus uh, points 
to that point when you start talking about the agent managing the SSHPs. Um, so we were just really happy with the fact that it kind of hit all our pain points when we talked to your salespeople. It's similar views on the cloud, similar views on kind of how infrastructure works, and it was a really good fit. Beautiful. And again, thank you for the expose here. Um, I, uh, let's pause because, uh, Nick, I'm going to transition now into a little bit of a walkthrough for our audience on, you know, Jump Cloud, its position as a directory, and we'll talk about identity and access management, especially for sort of the, the DevOps-minded folks, um, and we'll do a demonstration as well. So uh, I'll have you hit mute, Nick, and then be prepared for some questions from the audience coming up here in a bit. Thanks again. So let's move in now, folks, to Gem Cloud's directory as a service. Uh, uh, the team and I built this product, uh, quite honestly, in the spirit of traditional directories. Um, I think it's an immutable fact that you need a central authentication store. So that, that much we all know. You need a way to govern and control access. Um, but the traditional way of thinking about that was, um, frankly, twofold. Either one, exactly as Nick described, Oh, we're built, our company's scaling. It looks like it's time to call 1-800-GET-MICROSOFT and fire up an AD. Um, the other is, uh, you know, we don't, you know, we're a Linux-focused sort of, you know, kind of organization. I'll just build my own LDAP server. And either of those choices obviously can be successful, but for all the reasons that you, we just talked through, um, you are consumed uh, by still having to manage that infrastructure. I, the day and the age of managing servers to manage pieces of IT infra is going by the way of the dodo. And frankly, directory services um, uh, are, again, probably the last component of things, quote unquote, floating to the cloud um, that can successfully and securely be done so in that way. So that's really what the team and I, when we built this hypothesis and moved forward on building a cloud-based directory, that literally was it. And our product, which you'll see here live in a second, um, is responsible for the uh, secure uh, assignment of resources to specific employees, meaning anything from their systems, Windows, Mac, and Linux systems, and the appropriate authentication to wireless networking and or switches um, for VPN, for example, for, you know, it doesn't matter. As long as it speaks radius, um, we can, uh, of course, consume that and authenticate appropriately. To storage, meaning we understand that you may have uh, either virtualized Samba servers or freestanding actual physical NAS devices like QNAP or Synology. Those things are real. We have one here. Um, it, you need to get appropriate access to that. And finally, like in the case of Nick, applications. And those could be web -based, or, excuse me, web-based apps where the SAML protocol will come into play, uh, what you may commonly known as single sign-on, uh, and or LDAP, which is the more traditional way to bind on-premise applications or legacy applications to uh, an authentication store. In either case, when we talk about single sign-on, we are providing a true and larger footprint of single sign-on for all of the resources that an employee needs, uh, clearly not just a web-based application. So we, again, really have focused on protocols uh, and the centralized, secure way of managing an employee's credentials without, frankly, you know, uh, ever seeing the credentials themselves. We do this all very interestingly. From a DevOps perspective, um, the, the identity and access management controls that the directory has puts the user in the center of our directory. It's up to you as the administrator to assign what that particular employee or group of users gets access to. So in the case of things like G Suite or Office 365, those both have wonderful user stores and they can provide amazing authentication through you know, OAuth as an example, to other uh, applications, but they are not directories. Um, in, in our case, we underpin a G Suite or an Office 365, so your employee uses the same password, the same set of credentials to access 
their Gmail account as they will their, their MacBook or their Linux host. So again, we focus on that in addition to all the security protocols, including multi-factor across these endpoints, whatever, whichever they may be. Um, and for the DevOps folks in the audience, we have gone very deep on SSH key management. So the ability for the users to self-manage their SSH keys, but also ensure that the administrators can redact or revoke or otherwise exchange those keys in, in emergency situations. So your specific operators, your, you know, your individual contributing you know, DevOps operator uh, um, is not the only one with their you know, SSH key access. The, the, uh, the DevOps lead or those managing Jump Cloud have full access and control for security reasons as well. From a systems management standpoint, um, we are responsible for Again, Windows, Mac, and Linux hosts. So in the case of how we do this, like many other uh, companies and products, we are responsible for um, the installation of a lightweight agent that sits on the box. And this agent connects to GemCloud through mutual TLS through a, a very tightly controlled PKI infrastructure. So just understand um, the security that we go to bind a, you know, a Linux host or frankly a Windows or Mac host um, anywhere it exists, either in phys physicality like a MacBook in your hand or virtually up in Amazon or GCP, the, the agent provides effectively four things. One, user account control. You can deploy local user accounts on the machines virtually no matter where they exist. Two, um, it gives you password control and your users can get authenticated so that they can actually enter a session um, and work natively on the box. So there's nothing kind of virtual or proxy we're doing here. We own the local account on these operating systems. Two is the ability for you as a DevOps operator to execute code and distribute that code across these fleets of machines. So there, you could do ad hoc queries, you can pull user information. If you can write Bash or Shell or PowerShell for Windows or you know, Python, it really doesn't matter. The agent runs as root uh, and enables you to effectively execute that code. The third thing is uh, multi-factor authentication. So when and if you need an additional sort of doorway to get access into, uh, let's say a Linux host, you'll have Duo for mobile or Google Authenticator uh, to any TOTP generating device um, that will generate your token in order to successfully authenticate in addition to your password. Um, and the last thing is that, we, that this agent does is provide um, event logging. So understanding who is logging in, when did they do it, was it a success or failure, um, but will also provide brute force login attempt lockdowns too of systems. So if you're getting DDoSed, uh, our, our infrastructure will immediately block those accounts, lock the machines, and provide an administrator accessible way to get into the machine uh, in the case of you know, a threat like that. So moving on into networks. Um, in this, so if you take a system where we just talked about having an agent on the box, that's our mechanism of binding that, that thing, that resource, a system to the directory. Let's talk about networks. So you've got like, like Nick has, or like we have here, we have Cisco gear through and through. Uh, but we have to have that Cisco gear uh, point back to the Jump Cloud directory so everyone is utilizing their individual credentials. There are no credentials that are shared here. We do have a guest network that literally is for guests, but everyone from their mobile phone to their MacBooks or, or Windows machines here is all utilizing their individual personal credentials to get into that, and that is done through a radius as a service infrastructure. So you will point your devices and switches um, at, you know, utilizing the RADIUS protocol at the Jump Cloud RADIUS endpoint, which is your RADIUS endpoint, um, to provide that secure authentication and use groups to restrict access to specific um, networks that some people should be on, like, you know, your DevOps team should be, get access to the VPN, uh, but your general rank and file employees shouldn't. So you have complete control over who can access what. 
From a storage perspective, as mentioned, um, this is a really finicky thing. Um, it, you will, in effect, take a Samba server, and that could be you know, an off-the-shelf NAS appliance like a Synology, um, and you're going to point that device at our LDAP endpoint, which we provide for you. So again, this is an example of you don't have to manage LDAP anymore. You just point your resources at our virtualized LDAP endpoint, uh, in order to gain control over access to those things that speak LDAP. Uh, you know, NAS devices are one of them. And getting that right and secure, very tricky, but JumpCloud was able to do that, uh, especially with the very antiquated components of that protocol, like, you know, the Samba protocol in particular. I think you, anyone who has some gray hair understands what I'm talking about, with, but these things are still extremely ubiquitous. So we've got to support it and do it in a very secure way. And finally, applications. Again, using LDAP, let's say your, your, um, your DevOps and engineering team, they love Jira, you have your on-prem, or you know, you've got a, a Windows machine or a Linux server that's got the Jira stack on it, that's serving up you know, your sort of web page for Jira, for your ticket management, right? But those can, that product line, the Atlassian product line, like billions of others can defer its authentication and user accounts to an LDAP server. Um, in fact, you're going to see this live here in a second with my JIRA setup. Uh, but um, again, any resource that can speak LDAP or SAML can tap into the, those protocol layers and use a central set of credentials uh, in order to gain authentication. So now, it's time to kind of show off the goods. Let me kind of lay out um, what I'm about to show you. I'm going to get out of this presentation mode. And I, let me walk you around my desktop here just to sort of articulate a, a number of disparate resources that we have here. So first and foremost, let's fire up. Uh, here we go. The first most important aspect of this is the Jump Cloud user portal. This is what you're looking at here. Um, this is where you're doing all of these sort of point and click access control uh, between employees, like you see a list of users here, and the various resources that they need access to. This demonstration, um, I know this is going to sound weird. If I do this right, it's going to be largely unimpressive. And why, why is that? Because uh, it should be super fast and efficient and quick. Um, and it almost requires me to go back and sort of say, this is what happened behind the scenes to show you how quickly um, we provided access to resources securely. And I'll explain the demo here in a second. Let me show you the other resources. Uh, the other one I have here is the Office 365 um, administrative console. We're going to be visiting that console here in a minute. Its kind of competitive twin is the Google uh, G Suite um, administrative dashboard, what is now the Google Cloud Identity dashboard. Um, we have in the background, here is that JIRA instance. Please don't think I'm cheap because I didn't pay for this JIRA instance. I love you, Atlassian, but I'm just using it to show off how cool your product is with LDAP. And then finally, in the very background, I, I do have a VM here. Um, I, I just chose, in this case, a Windows box. It's a Windows 10 box. This could be a Linux server. It could be a um, a MacBook, it doesn't really matter to us. The authentication kind of demonstration is all relatively identical. So those are the bits and pieces that we're going to be playing with here. Now, what am I going to do? So we're going to do a, an onboarding. We're going to create a fictitious uh, employee. Um, I'll think of a name on the fly here in a second, but this employee we're going to pretend is a new member of our AWS production or DevOps team. Um, and how do I get this person access to the right resources? So let's pause there and let's just sort of show you the different types of resources. As mentioned, the first thing that you're looking at here, sitting at the core of Jump Cloud, is the user directory. These are all the lists of employees that I have in my organization that have an identity managed in Jump Cloud. We give you various states of the user. So anything in green, active, you know, employee that's happily gain, gaining access to their resources. Things in red, you may see. Um, here's a, a great example of this guy, Chip Baker, or someone trying with his credentials uh, has been locked out due to failed login attempts. 
We have other states uh, like this particular guy in orange. This is a new employee we've sent the uh, email to to get signed up for GemCloud, basically set your password. But this particular person, Justin Boyle, has not done that yet. So we will tell you um, all of the states of the employees, when their passwords will expire, and when you dip into a specific user, like we'll pick the first guy here, Greg Agosta, this is like your portal into everything that this person touches. So for first and foremost, what user groups does this particular guy belong to? What systems does he have authentication access to, like user accounts on? What directories are, are he, is he able to authenticate through and has accounts on? Um, and finally, any custom attributes that we want to define about this particular guy. From a systems management standpoint, JumpCloud, as I've already mentioned, it binds a system, either a virtual system like a Linux host or a, you know, an actual workstation through the installation of an agent. That agent, um, we provide um, at right out of box, most of our Linux focused customers like DevOps folks are using um, a baked in image of the particular agent. It's got your connect key, your personal key, um, in order to make a dedicated connection to uh, the jump, your jump cloud tenant. Um, in the case of Windows or Mac, uh, it's done through, you know, again, a, a, an XE or a DMG respectively. Um, easy peasy, it, you know, those things can be baked into images as well. Um, and for the DevOps folks, again, we have full puppet and chef recipes uh, in order to send out this package to vast distributions of Linux infrastructure. Um, from an individual system standpoint, we give you lots of media information from the machine serial number. We can tell you what system groups it belongs in. This one does not belong to any groups right now. We can tell you what users are on the machine. It, it's showing me no users are bound to the machine yet. This is the machine I'm actually going to use for the demo. And as we'll dip into next, uh, policies. Um, if you've ever seen or utilized a, 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 a Microsoft GPO, uh, JumpCloud's policies are an analog to that, but in our own unique way and frankly a cross-platform way. So you as an administrator can build Governing, governing policies that range from security to configuration across Windows, Mac, and Linux. I just have a couple of standard ones here like, you know, setting lock screen timeouts um, for Mac and Windows, but, you know, we have a complete library of these as well. Groups are exactly what they um, kind of mean, but we have, uh, like, when you really look at JumpCloud, when we actually get through the demo here, everything revolves around groups. So, um, for example, in our AWS production user group, right, um, we know who the group, uh, the actual users are in the group, naturally, but we know what system groups that these users will be provided access to. These are the applications that that particular set of users can get access to. These are the radius servers that that group of users can get access to and of course the directories they have access to. So simply put, your modeling and security architecture revolves around groups and your job then becomes adding users to a group to give them access to these things or taking them away when you remove them from the group. From an application standpoint, we support hundreds of SAML based applications out of box. I just have a few that you see lit up here. In the case of Amazon, I can create multiple independent connectors for the division of roles through IAM um, and provide different people different levels of access. So all of this, of course, is done through the SAML2 protocol. Directories are JumpCloud's ability to either underpin a, a set of directories like G Suite or Office 365 uh, and provision users to and from those directories. Uh, in the case of Active Directory, we actually can play the role of a, a slave agent. So if you want to use AD as an authority, great, do that. Um, and use JumpCloud to elegantly map things to the cloud. The majority of our customer base utilizes JumpCloud as the single authoritative directory, but I'm ar articulating here that you actually have the ability to connect our product and its directory to an AD. 
And finally, GemCloud's LDAP endpoint um, is responsible for acting like an LDAP. You will spin up on your own, but you never have to do that anymore. You just map them to us. Command execution, as mentioned, gives you the ability in order to write code and execute that code across the fleets of machines, entire groups of machines. Uh, and then again, finally, the RADIUS system here enables you to spin up RADIUS servers on the fly, as many as you need, or as little as you need, without touching free RADIUS or downloading open source or buying something that would require you to ha manage a, a RADIUS server. That, that's nonsense, you shouldn't have to do that anymore. So, without further ado, let's go through this onboarding exercise. That's sort of a quick top to bottom of what this product contains. And clearly, there's tons of detail below just this tip of the iceberg. Uh, but let's walk through this demonstration. All right, day one of our employer, maybe even the days leading up to this particular employee coming on board, I have to create an identity. Now, interestingly, I'm creating an identity here inside of Jump Cloud, but just note, you may have a process that you build your identity in G Suite first or Office 365 first because you want to get them on email and sort of get them in the flow of the company. We can import those and own those identities as well. I'm just showing you the process from Jump Cloud and we'll be distributing the identity out to various endpoints. So let's think of a name. Uh, Donald Duck. Let's say Donald um, Casey. How about that? Good Irish name. And his form, his formal username will be, you know, Donald uh, dot Casey. Uh, and his email at our organization uh, is at uh, demojumpcloud.com. This would naturally would be your organization's email. Those that Office 365 and G Suite tenant, those are live tenants. They're mapped um, to that de at demo, uh, demojumpcloud.com domain. So now, um, there's a couple of things you need to understand here. Like a, an old school directory, um, I can set as an administrator, I can give this guy a password, and that's what I'm gonna do now, sort of activating the account. And I say old school only because uh, a directory should provide the administrator, like you guys, the ability to light up an account or otherwise change a password or uh, disable an account. So, but in this case, um, just to ex um, expedite the demonstration, I've got Donald lit up. The other mechanism is I could have, this product could have fired off an email out to Donald. This is the more secure way to say, Donald, welcome to your identity management solution. It's called GemCloud. It's going to give you access to everything that you need. Let's start by get, you know, having you set your own password and ensuring it falls into compliance with GemCloud's password complexity rules, which you can model inside of our product. So I, again, I've lit up Donald's account, um, but I, you know, the thing that I forgot, I, I forgot to give him access to stuff, right? I just lit up his account, but let's first go into user groups. So Donald is a fictitious member of our, our DevOps team, and he's going to be working on our AWS production infrastructure. Cool, right? So I'm going to add him as a user member of that group, right? And just like I showed you before, all the other stuff about Donald, the systems, the directories, I don't have to touch any of that because when I save this guy, he is automatically going to be distributed to the various things that he needs through that user group. Actually, there's one other. I, from an individual basis, I actually do want to assign him to his new machine. Um, while he's a DevOps guy, he's a traditionalist, and we're going to give him access to a Windows box that he preferred. Um, and he is going to be an admin on that box as well. All right, I can redact those permissions at any time, but I know he's going to have to install some software, so I'm going to make him an admin on his uh, new Windows 10 laptop. All right, now I'm going to hit save. So here is the moment where I remember where I said, if I do my job right, this becomes largely unimpressive because the guts of the impressive stuff is like what JumpCloud is doing, or it, frankly, is already finished with doing underneath the covers. It's our protocols, it's our core directory services now that instantly have distributed Donald's information out to all of the places it needs to be. 
So remember, I, I, I have him on the user group, and now I know what systems he now has access to. These are all the systems he has access to, including his own personal machine. All these servers that you know we just instantly granted him access to. We instantly granted him access to you know being on LDAP, being on G Suite, etc. So let's go see what that looks like. All right. So if I head on over into the Office 365 admin group, uh, I bet you he will be there. Let's search for him, Donald. There's Donald Casey. He already has his Office 365 active account set up. And I bet if I go over into G Suite, go into its list of users. Oops, I need to reauthenticate. And of course, there we go. Hopefully it doesn't lock me out. Come on. There we go. Sorry about the fat fingering. Heading on over into the G Suite administrative console, we're going to find the same thing. So if I look for Donald, there's Donald Casey. So now he's got his G Suite account set up. Let's move even further. Let's go over into that LDAP instance, or frankly, JIRA instance that's connected to LDAP. So here I am. Uh, this is a Windows, a virtualized Windows server. In fact, this Windows machine is up on Google Cloud um, that I'm RDPing into. Um, if I head over into user directories, let me authenticate so I can get access to that and I look at the edit field, this is the, the configuration screen of any standard app will look and feel almost identical to this. This is a great example of really how the LDAP protocol is instantiated inside of a, a traditional enterprise app. So you'll see um, it's, you know, it's a standard um, endpoint, ldap.gemcloud.com. We use both port 389 and 636, ensuring uh, start TLS or SSL. Uh, and again, like any other, um, you know, a real open LDAP instance, we use a binding mechanism. I, so I have my binding user account, et cetera. Uh, and of course, group-based permissions. You guys are probably expert at this. But when I head on over into um, actually directories and I'm going to synchronize, um, let's bring in our Donald account. So right now this is banging against the, you know, the, this is one cloud, Google Cloud with this Windows server banging against our other cloud endpoint, the LDAP endpoint. Let's head on over into users. I'll look up Donald. Let me filter. And again, Donald Casey is right here. It even knows its group membership. So if I'm using group membership based authentication for RBAC inside of Jira or any app, um, all of that is governed by Jump Cloud as well. And finally, Let's go back into my, uh, my actual session on my MacBook here. Remember that little old uh, Windows machine? So let's take a look. I'm going to log in as this admin user. And we will log out. Basically what I'm doing is just waking this machine back up. And what we have done behind the scenes, the agent on a at roughly 60 second interval has picked up a change. It's talking to Jump Cloud through an outbound port 443 call. So you as DevOps folks should know your Linux servers, your individual workstations like this will never require you to open up a port. We're only using standard outbound calls. Um, so just for security reasons, you should understand that. And now you can see Mr. Donald Casey has his own particular password, or I'm sorry, his account set up. I'm entering in the Jump Cloud password. And in this case, what it's going to do is take me through my boot up sequence. This is live fire demonstration that you're seeing here. So this user account that I made up on the fly has never been seen on this Windows box. Uh, and lo and behold, um, you've got a fully onboarded employee. Everything now this user needs access to from their personal machine to their networks to their web-based apps to their on-premise LDAP-backed apps, we've done that. And again, if I was in, yapping my brains out here talking to you, this would have been a three-click operation, done, onboarded, get me on to my next, next task. So let's head back over into our webinar. And now what we would like to do is just talk quickly so we can get into some Q&A. 
Um, why GemCloud? Why companies like Tamer are looking at us? It's centralized identity management without the baggage of installing or otherwise, you know, building servers to manage an identity stack. That is gone. Um, greater IT and end user efficiency. We want your users to have access to stuff. We want them to self-manage their passwords, not begging you as IT folks to change their passwords. I know you can appreciate that. Uh, and frankly, uh, increased security. Um, we do security as a security company, so you don't have to think about it. It's a bold statement. We take it seriously, uh, and we uh, invite you to talk with us deeply and privately about what that means to us and our audits and our, our attestations of security on a 24 by 7 basis. There's a couple of resources you, you can grab. One is the DevOps I am in a box, which is an e a, a guide, uh, or LDAP user management, a fully automated case study, um, which is an expose of the Tamer case study. Um, again, you'll see Nick featured there, um, but it goes into very elaborate depths of many of the items that we only touched upon here in, uh, in roughly the hour that we've spent together. With all that said, I hope it was efficient. Um, I, before we go into Q&A, Nick, I really want to thank you both for being on this webinar and for participating in our case study, um, all the resources of which the attendees to this webinar can gain access to. So without further ado, Mr. Schimmel, uh, I'll let you open up the floodgates for our Q&A. Greg, unfortunately, we're not going to have a lot of time for Q&A. Got it. We, we try to respect people's time here. They take time out of their day to join our webinars. Um, we, we do, however, have a half a dozen or so questions. What, I, what I'd like to do is get them over to you, Greg, or perhaps you and Nick can write to the several folks who, uh, who wrote um, and get them their questions. But I, I, I apologize to our audience. We usually, I know we don't run over, but... Um, We'll get these questions out to you. There, there is some interesting things about Ansible support, uh, smart card, smart card authentication, yep. uh, support. Um, Let's do this perfect idea. Let's get these guys back to their workday, and each of them uh, will receive a personalized response. Perfect. We have their info, Greg, and um, we'll get them something, and maybe we'll try to get them something out from DevOps.com as well. Uh, we'll get that over to you. Guys, again, apologies for running late. We, we do respect your time. We know you're busy. It was a great demo, though, and I, I love a good demo. So I'm a, I'm a sucker for good demos, Greg. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, guys, Nick, I know you've got to run as well. Continued success with Tamer. Thank you so much for coming on and, and helping Greg and us here today explain a little bit about this to our DevOps audience. And to our audience, we'll see you soon on another DevOps.com webinar. Greg, great job, man. I'll be in touch. I can't wait to see you guys out in Boulder soon. And uh, this is Alan Schimmel for DevOps.com. Have a great day, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, Alan.